Hanley, the Director of Education. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Before we officially get started, I just want to begin by saying a few things about upcoming events. Uh, if you haven't been here in a while, we've got always a lot of events happening in the museum. Many of them are free. Uh, a very exciting one coming up on Wednesday, May 9th, a film screening of Martin Scorsese's George Harrison Living in the Material World film. Uh, it is free. Tickets actually go on sale uh, this Friday, so you just have to make a reservation if you're a member. For the general public, it's on Monday, April 30th at 10 a.m. Uh, I will uh, point out, especially those of you who attend events regularly, that this event starts a little earlier than 7 o'clock, our normal start time. It starts at 6.30, and the reason for that, it is three and a half hours long. So, <laughs> bring a granola bar or something with you. Be prepared and for the long haul. Um, but as I know, many of the George Harrison fans here will uh, be excited to stick it out the whole time. So those, uh, again, the member presale this Friday at 10, general public next Monday. Uh, we've got another great film coming up in May on the 16th at 7 o'clock. That's our kind of normal st starting time. Uh, film screening of Louder Than Love, The Grandy Ballroom Story. And we'll actually have producer-director Tony D'Annunzio here to talk a little bit about making the film and about The Grandy Ballroom. Um, so that'll be a fantastic film as well. Uh, that is not actually available to make reservations yet. It will be free, but you'll see that go up on the website soon. So stay tuned for that. Also, how many of you in here have been had a chance to see the Grateful Dead exhibit so far? Nice, very good. Awesome, awesome exhibit. Another amazing job by our curatorial staff, um, going through not just the history of the dead themselves, but bringing in aspects of fans and tapers and the culture surrounding the dead, the artwork surrounding it. Uh, it's really a fantastic exhibit. If you haven't had a chance to see it yet, I recommend you get up there. That'll be our major exhibit on levels five and six uh, for the foreseeable future. I should also mention, officially, this event will be filmed, photographed, and streamed on our website, both live and in the future, for the museum's educational purposes. Please be aware that your image may appear in the footage. It's always the chance where I look to see if anybody wants to get out, and no, we're good. All right. <laughs> um, if you want to stay connected and find out more about our programming, the best way to do that is to become a member. As you just saw, you even get first chance opportunities to sign up for a lot of the events. Um, an advance notice about what's coming down the pike. But also, you can get onto our educational email blast by just sending an, uh, an email to education at rockhall.org. Let us know you want to be put on our mailing list, and we will get in touch with you that way. Uh, that way, you can find out about many of our great programs uh, that we do here in this theater and in the museum throughout the year. All right, so um, to officially get us started for this evening's program, let me introduce Terry Stewart, the president and CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. Thank you, Terry. Good evening, good evening. Thank you, thank you. How many of you went to anything in the inductions? Did anybody make any of those events? If not, why not? What's wrong with you people? We had free events. Uh, yeah, both hands and your feet. Get them up there. We had a tremendous success, uh, I think both uh, emotionally and critically. Uh, Everybody we've talked to thought everything was wonderful, everything was sold out, so we're very thrilled about that. One of the events that happened during that <coughs> week or 11 days was the official dedication of the Library and Archives, and I'd like to recognize that some of our library people are here tonight. There, where are you hiding, kids? Over there, yes, see there, right there. And I, I urge you to, thank you for making the jaunt over tonight. I urge all of you to try out, uh, test drive that, that new building over there. It's open free. You can go in there and bury yourself in magazines, books, movies, CDs, whatever may, you know, shake you, move you. So I, I and uh, <coughs> I can't wait to go over and spend some time just sitting around there and bothering the librarians. I've got my card. You can get your library card over there. If you could show us the library card, you can be most proud of. So I, I, I ho hope you'll do that. Tonight is uh, a, another great night. Uh, I say that every time we have these, but I'm very proud of, again this evening because this is the second in our series of uh, lectures connected to the American Musicological Society. And uh, it takes me a long time to say those words. Gotta, he said I could say AMS, but I don't want to. And the only other event like this is a similar uh, relationship that the AMS has with the Library of Congress and uh, the Music Division Library of Congress. So it's very special that we have these, uh, these speakers in here. And the last gentleman who was here, Albin Zach, um, much like the gentleman's here tonight, uh, caused me to read his book, I don't sound like nobody, and I like to read all this, and I've perused uh, the ones tonight uh, from David Brackett, but I have to admit I have to go buy them, particularly I'm lusting after Jason's first edition with the dust cover over here, 
which I will purloin from him at some point and replace with a paperback and he'll never know it. So uh, I'm thrilled that you're here and uh, tell your friends these, these events are very special. You'll walk away knowing uh, so much more about the music that we celebrate and uh, with that I'll turn it back over to Jason. Thank you, Terry. So it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the second lecture of the new series sponsored by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum and the American Musicological Society. Our goal in creating this series is to bring outstanding musicological studies of popular music, and more specifically rock and roll, to a broader audience. We will be presenting two lectures a year. For those of you who are interested in presenting as part of the program, you can find information on how to submit a proposal on the American Musicological Society website, which is ams-net.org. Uh, as Terry said, Albin Zach delivered the first lecture in the series last October. And at that time, we were still waiting for the museum's library and archives to officially open its doors. I'm happy to say that just over two weeks ago, during the 2012 Rock Hall induction ceremony here in Cleveland, we did celebrate that grand opening. Already a number of scholars, journalists, musicians, and fans have visited the library located on the metro campus of the Cuyahoga Community College to conduct research, listen to music, and explore the history of rock and roll. Visiting researchers have access to never before seen materials, including the archival collections of some of popular music's most significant figures, including Alan Freed, Clive Davis, Ahmet Erdogan, Mel Austin, Joe Smith, Seymour Stein, and Jerry Wexler. For the first time, video footage of the museum's extensive programming is also available, including the Hall of Fame series, uh, the induction ceremonies, the American Music Masters series, and the Songwriters to Soundmen series. As the library continues to develop its holdings of primary sources, we encourage proposals for this series that draw on those archival collections. In fact, our guest speaker tonight was over at the library earlier today touring with Andy Leach, who I think is out here, right Andy? There he is. Um, and looking at some old issues of uh, Cashbox magazine. I should also mention that the catalog is now online and you can explore the various collections right from the comfort of your own home. But you have to come here to see them. Um, I should say hello to our viewing audience around the world tonight. Each of these events will be streamed live on the Rock Hall website and archived on the AMS website. And full tapes of each event will be available at the Library and Archives. I'd like to thank uh, Bob Judd from the American Musicological Society for helping to put all of these together and get everything going. Also, archiving Albin Zach's lecture from October is up in uh, its full form on the AMS website. And I also want to thank the members of the AMS subcommittee for helping to put the talks together. So I'm excited uh, that tonight we're able to have with us David Brackett from McGill University to present his talk entitled Foxtrots, Hillbillies, and the Classic Blues, categorizing popular music in the 1920s. David's work has been an inspiration to me personally. In fact, it was early in my graduate school coursework when his first major book was published. And as Terry mentioned, I wanted to brag about it. So I brought my first edition out here, which I realized still had the receipt of when I bought it at the AMS meeting in Boston. So <laughs> I was very nerdy, apparently put it in the back. Uh, interpreting popular music was and is such an important book because it works on an experiential level to describe and quantify the inner workings of various popular music songs by artists like Hank Williams, James Brown, Elvis Costello, uh, and Billy, Billy Holiday and Bing Crosby. Looking back on it now, we can see how it pushed musicology deep into the study of popular music and established an interpretive frame framework that we still use today. It definitely worked to position the understanding gained from this analysis into a theoretical framework to suggest that not only was popular music worthy of study, but that the tools and skills musicologists already had could be applied to popular music, even if that was in a manner, in a manner that was at times contentious and at other times generated results that was unlike what we might expect when studying classical music. His analysis looked to link the effective aspects of musical sounds with the perceptions of musical listeners. David also worked hard to present his research in a way that could be understood by an audience outside of musicology while maintaining the rigor of the discipline. For example, in interpreting popular music, he writes, quote, popular music reminds us that all music arises in social context, that all music from the romantic era onward struggled with the contradictions of artistic production in a capitalist economic system, 
And most importantly, that we remember a piece of music and return to it again and again because it means something, because it has the power to change our lives." End quote. David teaches in the Schulich School of Music at McGill University, where he is chair of the musicology program. In addition to nearly 40 single authored journals, uh, articles, book chapters, and book reviews. He has published two books, Interpreting Popular Music, first published by Cambridge in 1995, and The Pop, Rock, and Soul Reader, Histories and Debates, published by Oxford University Press and about to enter its third edition, a book that I've personally used many times uh, teaching in classes and that developed out of David's own work uh, teaching popular music courses for, what is it, almost 20 years now, David, right? Um, at various universities. David is uh, currently working on two other books. The first, A History of Genre in Popular Music from the 1920s to the Present, tentatively titled Crossover Dreams. The second is an account of musical genre and its relationship to cultural prestige in a specific historical moment, tentatively titled 1966, The Year in Music. Before re-entering school to do his graduate work, David was active for several years in California as a freelance guitarist, playing jazz, classical music, and rock and roll. And uh, with one of his most notable associations being a stint with the Western swing legend, David Stogner. So it is my pleasure to welcome, and please let's give a warm Rock and Roll Hall of Fame welcome to our special guest tonight, David Brackett. see my paper. Okay, here we go. Um, I want to thank uh, the Rock Hall and Jason, Terry, and uh, the AMS for inviting me here and making this talk possible. I'm thrilled to be here giving a talk, and I'd like to quote my brother, who upon hearing I was going to speak here said that he always knew I'd make it here somehow. <clears throat> what kind of music is the title of an article that is well known among scholars of popular music? This article, first published by Italian scholar Franco, Franco Fabri in 1982 and reprinted numerous times since, has acquired the status of a classic and is often justly referred to as one of the first works of popular music scholarship to venture an account of genre. Fabri opens the article by recounting some of the many situations in which the question, what kind of music, can arise. Okay, from fellow passengers on a train who see him traveling with his guitar, from theater managers whom Fabri has asked to hire their premises for a concert, and from other musicians when he has asked to join their group, to name only a few. The most dramatic of these instances focuses on the greeting he and his bandmates received upon crossing European borders in the 1970s, in which the border guards would inevitably ask them, so what kind of music do you play? Fabri notes that this last interrogative may seem comic. But at the same time, this question is extremely serious, and we know well what it implies. If the reply is classical music, there should be no problems but we can easily imagine the reaction of the gendarme to responses like hard rock and reggae, a breathalyzer test for the driver and a search of the minivan. This anecdote gives some idea of the stakes involved and how genre is reflexively related to issues of identity. Indeed, this question, what kind of music, is frequently asked of musicians in all sorts of contexts. Similar questions might begin the conversations of music fans as in, what kind of music do you like? I have been writing and thinking about this question for longer than I would want to admit today. But part of its fascination and part of the difficulty in answering the question lies in how central questions of genre are to communication about music and to the role music plays in people's sense of who they are, even as the most cursory exploration of the concept reveals many contradictions and messy details. 
To illustrate further the con centrality of the concept of genre to people's sense of themselves, we need only consider how any number of contemporary genres, such as hip hop, electronic dance music, teen pop, heavy metal, R&B, and country music, can immediately conjure up a demographic group defined by age, gender, sexuality, race, class, and geographical region. The difficulty of the concept comes with the awareness that people other than the group most associated with the genre participate in it as musicians and fans, and that listeners within a demographic group have a wide range of tastes. For example, hip hop, especially uh, at the moment of its public emergence, uh, was associated with African Americans. But not all fans of hip hop are African American, nor do all African Americans like hip hop. Furthermore, a label such as hip hop may, rap, may mask the great variety of musical style found between recordings and performances that are classified under that label. As a side note, I will add that categories of identity themselves camouflage the variety of modes of identification contained within such categories. Many musicians and fans seem to recognize this when they resist trying to explain what kind of music they play or like, for they are aware, aware that the process of categorizing music masks the internal difference and uniqueness of the disparate musics that are lumped together. Yet sometimes in the next breath, a musician, after refusing to label her or himself, may turn around and place an ad looking for a bandmate that reads something like this, quote, punk funk group influenced by jazz and easy listening, looking for emo flavored vocalists with heavy metal background to add vocals to a power trio. This is, I, was, I wrote here, this may be a bit of an exaggeration. It is an exaggeration. But see, for ex instance, some examples from the website bandmix.com, a site for musicians in the New York City area trying to find people to play with. And here are just three examples. And you can see under what they call style, um, various things, Christian contemporary classical blues, hip-hop, rap, reggae, alternative, modern rock. So they can be pretty, pretty more diverse than uh, stereotypes of uh, musicians might lead us to think. Um, <clears throat> in my own work, I've been primarily concerned with the emergence and subsequent role of the three main categories used for popular music in the United States that have dominated the music industry since the 1920s. These have been the music associated with African Americans, music associated with white people from the southern states, and a third unmarked category that has nonetheless by default signified bourgeois urban white people, and that has been frequently aligned with the term mainstream. So this slide shows um, an overview. Wow, that's interesting. What am I doing? Moving around by itself. OK. Um, it shows, um, it's the wind. Um, so you can see here uh, that what I'm calling mainstream has actually never officially been called the mainstream, except um, sort of uh, in reference to the other two categories. But um, I follow how this has been referred to in record company catalogs, and then from uh, 1939 onward in popularity charts. Um, so you can see it's, it's relatively stable, the mainstream. African American popular music has gone through many changes. Um, and I'll talk about some of those uh, later in the paper. And uh, the music associated with white southern rural people similarly was quite turbulent until around 1949, in which case it's actually the, the most uh, stable of all. Um, as my descriptions indicate, from the beginning of this period, categories of music have been associated with categories of people. I take neither of these for granted, but rather try to understand how it is that certain relationships between categories of music and people become meaningful at particular times and places. In the 1920s, the period I will focus on later in this paper, categories for African American popular music and Southern rural music first appeared and bore the titles race music and old time tunes or 
old familiar music. And you can even see at the bottom of the chart in the, the sort of uh, lavender colored uh, section, um, all these terms were used simultaneously for uh, what later became country music. Um, before launching into the discussion of particular categories in the early 20th century, I want to outline a few of the ways identification with music can work. I think that this will help us understand how genres function and fulfill their social roles. Um, I draw here on the work of Georgina Bourne, who has proposed a four-pronged model for how music and identity can relate to one another. Um, the first of these is what uh, Bourne calls homology, uh, reproduction, reinforcement, actualization of extant sociocultural identities. And in these cases, it's where it seems to be, a, there seems to be a direct link between uh, a category of music and a group of people. So in the 1920s, uh, this is uh, how it appeared to people at the time, that the category of race music transparently referred to uh, African-American people as uh, producers and consumers, uh, et cetera. Her second category, uh, she calls purely imaginary, which includes ideas like exoticism and primitivism. Um, and uh, some examples of these would be minstrelsy, in which identity is performative. That is, the performer has no claim to be uh, the type of person that is being represented in the music. They're, they're performing an identity. Uh, um, late 19th century Orientalism, um, et cetera, in art music, Western art music. It's another example. Uh, imaginary forms that anticipate emergent homologies. Um, so in this case, uh, an example would be, say, white blues fans of the 1940s and 1950s, in which case it was a, an imaginary relation. But by the time we come around to blues rock in the late 1960s, um, we have a genre that then has associations of, um, of uh, whiteness. Uh, similarly, uh, jazz fans in the 1920s to 1940s era big band swing is another example of how uh, what may seem to be purely imaginary over time becomes uh, a, new, uh, a new kind of homology. And the, the, the last one is what she calls nostalgic imaginary forms, which are the most uh, common form of this is uh, official uh, uses of folk or traditional music. So when a uh, type of folk or traditional music is, is reified or, or becomes uh, sort of frozen in a static form in order to represent uh, the nation in, in one form or another. Uh, something, strangely enough, when we really look at race music and uh, old time music in the 1920s, it could be, depending on which moment in time uh, we, look, uh, uh, we, we look at, uh, you could see it as, as being in uh, uh, several of these different forms. And uh, I hope that will become clear as uh, the paper goes on. Um, First, though, before I talk about old time tunes and race music, I'm going to talk about another type of music called foreign music, which was a category of popular music that in many ways established a template for the idea of homologous music identity relations that would be so important in the formation of the race and old time categories. So what is foreign music? Before I started researching this, I'd never heard of it. Um, and um, briefly put, it was the most important category in the United States uh, recording industry before the 1920s outside of things like uh, classical music or just um, uh, music that wasn't identified with a particular um, demographic group. Uh, it was um, music recorded initially outside the United States and then imported. And then uh, during World War I and afterwards, it uh, they, they, it became music mostly recorded by immigrants in the United States. Um, changes in the location and identities of the performers also affected the type of material recorded as the orchestral arrangements of traditional and religious music that dominated the category before the war gave way to newly composed music of more populist uh, nature. And this is an advertisement um, from 1917 
that gives you some idea of what's involved. It's a little blurry at the bottom of the page, but this is from their catalog. And uh, so they're proudly announcing that they have records in the following foreign languages. And there's 17 uh, different languages there, including some div the kind of level of specificity that might um, that I, f I found kind of surprising that you know there's uh, German and Schwabish and uh, Italian and Neapolitan and they're, so they're very finely targeting these different uh, groups of European immigrants and this remained pop, uh, important in the music industry up through the 30s and 40s, uh, particularly with things like polka recordings uh, and things like that. When the first chart for hillbilly music appeared in 1939, it was right next to it, uh, a little chart for foreign records. So uh, the link was pretty, pretty clear. Um, the um, recording industry recognized uh, white immigrants as fertile turf for marketing. Two other markets, however, that developed during the early 1920s, catered, catered to native, catering to native-born immigrants proved to be of greater long-term importance to the record industry. For it was not only the new immigrants from Europe who used sound recordings to spread and interweave a sense of community and to allay feelings of homesickness. Workers in the urban north, recently arrived from the rural south, both black and white, were soon to be enshrined in their own music industry categories. If foreign music provided a model for the formation of categories having to do with black and white Southerners, then vaudeville performances of commercial blues songs performed by white women provided the specific performance template for the emergence of race music. This is because no precedence existed for uh, African Americans to record um, examples, wow, the voice of God <laughs> is emerging from me. Um, existed for African Americans to record uh, what people at the time or, and now call the Tin Pan Alley Blues. That is, songs with the word blues in the title that may or may not have a connection to the formal characteristics we now associate with the blues. Mamie Smith's 1920 recording of Crazy Blues is now recognized as the first example of race music and the classic blues. Prior to Crazy Blues, however, African American singers were recorded performing two types of music, minstrelsy and spirituals. In other words, the music recorded by African Americans was either very dignified and not officially presumed to be entertainment, as in spirituals, or music that treated black people like buffoons, as in minstrelsy. Neither of these genres provide a context in which African Americans could express interiority, emotions associated with human relationships, or responses to particular social situations that might be taken seriously. African Americans on record possessed either timeless dignity or ephemeral silliness and debauchery, but little in between. In what could seem like a surprising twist, prior to the advent of race records, the vocalists associated with blues and jazz, as I already mentioned, were all white. Um, two white female singers during the 1910s had been particularly linked with African-American associated styles such as ragtime, the coon song, blues, and jazz. And these were Sophie Tucker and Marion Harris. Both of these singers trumpeted their connections to and apprenticeships with African-American musicians. Tucker, uh, via coaching by b black musicians on how to perform coon songs and minstrel material, I just want to pause and think about that for a second. So this is a white woman coached by black people on how to perform material largely written by white people and styles created by white people that were mimicking black people. OK, so then she was ready to go once uh, she was prepared. And um, <laughs> Harris's connection, Marion Harris's connection, uh, came through her putatively southern provenance. She claimed to be from Kentucky. Uh, but was actually born in Indiana. Okay. In the interest of time, I'll concentrate here on Marion Harris, who, while working in a similar vaudeville-based coon song-dominated milieu as Sophie Tucker, brought a different musical sensibility to the plate. Compared to Tucker, the obvious minstrel-inspired dialect-isms are minimized. Harris's accent seems more like a generic southern accent or a white southern accent that comes and goes in her recordings, but which could plausibly be her own. 
The songs make use of minstrel-inspired imagery, picturing the South as paradise, and as, as in her paradise blues, but gone are the gross caricatures of African Americans often found in coon songs. The lyrics of many of her songs celebrate African American associated genres, such as blues, ragtime, and jazz, although occasionally these lyrics echo the condescension typical of the period. So while she can in one breath proclaim, quote, honey, don't play me no opera, play me some blue melodies in Paradise Blues, in uh, the song When I Hear That Jazz Band Play from 1917, she can announce that, quote, you'll hear them very soon. They play all out of tune. So, um, okay, there we go. Here's uh, the beginning of her Paradise Blues. Honey, don't play me no opera. No white musician of the era seems to have earned the respect of black musicians more than Harris. For example, none other than the father of the blues himself, W.C. Handy, praised her on two separate occasions. As to the singing of the blues, it would seem necessary first to be a colored contralto, except for the fact that Marion Harris is white. And Marion Harris sang blues so well that people hearing her records sometimes thought that the singer was colored. The respect came evidently not only from her ability to distance herself musically from other white vaudeville performers at the time, but from her championing of African American songwriters as well. Some people dispute the story, but word has it that Harris left Victor for Columbia because Victor refused to let her record what was destined to be the first vocal version of Handy's St. Louis Blues. What I hope is clear from my discussion of Marian Harris is that the idea of a woman singing songs identified as blues, jazz, or ragtime had been well established by 1920. In some ways, we could think of Marian Harris as the Elvis Presley of classic blues, or as a kind of gateway drug, preparing white audiences for the idea of a woman singing, uh, singing blue, the Tin Pan Alley blues. Um, Mamie Smith's first recordings in February 1920 of two Perry Bradford compositions, That Thing Called Love and You Can't Keep a Good Man Down, would have been unlikely to strike listeners as particularly innovative or controversial if they had not known the racial identity of the singer. Accompanied by what Bradford later called an Ofe orchestra, these compositions were very much in the mode of other popular jazzy material of the time, with some polite chromaticism and a few blue thirds. The orchestra does indeed sound similar to that heard on Harris's Victor recordings, and Smith sings in a style not radically different from Harris. That crazy blues presented a radical departure from these is evident from the first notes of the introduction. The raucous polyphony of the band was something new, far wilder than anything produced by the likes of the original Dixieland jazz band, or even an African-American virtuoso improvising instrumentalist like Wilbur Sweatman, for that matter. The relaxed playing, lending some credibility to Bradford's reminiscences of early morning inebriation preceding the recording session. When Smith enters, she has to raise her a level of intensity to keep up. The song is set in a key that pushes her voice into a higher register than her previous recording session, resulting in some harsh, raspy timbres at moments of melodic climax, unlike any singing heard on record before.
um, particularly notable are passages, passages such as that occurring um, during the, the next excerpt I'm going to pl play with the third phrase um, coming with the lines, now the doctor's going to do all that he can, but what you're going to need is an undertaker man. Here, Smith pushes her chest voice up to a high F and combines this with the blue seventh and melisma to produce a phrase that would come to be identified uh, as uh, an archetypical uh, blues or gospel type phrase uh, with its reiteration by numerous other performers. Smith also picks up on the rhythmic relaxation of the band, producing a kind of swing not heard from a vocalist on record before. What I've presented here is very cursory, with Marion Harris and Mamie Smith both standing in for numerous other recordings that were classified similarly to theirs. In picking two singers at the borders of their categories, a white vaudeville singer recognized for her affinity for African American music, a black vaudeville singer whose repertoire overlapped with white vaudeville, I might have implied that the sonic elements alone may be responsible for the distinction between mainstream popular music and uh, race music at this time. I want to admit the possibility, however, that sonic difference alone was not sufficient to create this distinction as the importance of pre-existing attitudes about certain types of musicians and genres can rarely be overstated, nor can the role of contemporary discourse as it circulates among the participants in a given field of cultural production. This is to say that our ideas about which sonic differences are significant are already informed by discourses that connect types of music with types of people. I want to talk a bit now on about the emergence of the term race music, because despite what I just said, when Mamie Smith recorded the song, there was no category of race music, so it was identified that way it, uh, retrospectively. Um, I want to talk about this and the small shifts that occurred between um, the recording of Crazy Blues in the recordings released in 1923 when the category of race music was finally recognized across the music industry. My point is that the people who were participating in the formation of this type of music did not know they were creating what would turn out to be a historical category. In general, that's true. People don't usually go, I'm setting out to, you know, create history now, you know. I mean, it just sort of happens, but that's what's so interesting. In retrospect, is people don't know what they're doing, but then it all kind of comes together. Rather, through a series of moves and dialogues between musicians, journalists, music business people, and consumers, they were gradually figuring out a way of creating a connection between a type of music and the type of people that was profitable for the music industry and intelligible for consumers. And that's very important because often people talk about genre as if it's just being created by the music industry. But the music industry has created labels and categories that have not caught on. So for things to have a lasting historical impact, they have to make sense. And also people in the music industry are not living in a separate world from everyone, despite the way it may sometimes seem. But uh, anyway. Um, OK. I will be f referring in the next section of this talk to the way in which recordings were categorized in record company catalogs and in the pages of music industry journals, the most prominent of which um, was the now defunct Talking Machine World. Uh, Talking Machine World included long lists of upcoming record releases uh, that were broken down first by record company and then by category or genre. And you know, you can't imagine the, the hours of pleasure I've had poring over these long lists of, uh, <laughs> yes, well, that was supposed to be a joke, but probably it little, cuts a little too close to the truth, I guess. Um, the release of Crazy Blues, or, or 
it's probably some, maybe it's something a lot of us really enjoy doing, and we, but we just don't want other people to know about it. Um, the release of Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith did not automatically lead to the formation of a new category, even if it provided the impetus. Crazy Blues appeared in the list of upcoming record releases in Talking Machine World in the October 15, 1920 issue, described as a popular blues song. OK, the recording company that recorded the song, took out a full-page advertisement in the same issue of uh, Talking Machine World with Smith pictured in profile, proclaiming her as a, quote, singer of blues, the music of so new a flavor. And uh, actually, you could see her face in the original, but through several generations of reproduction, it's, uh, it's really become just a profile. Um, the music may have had so new a flavor, but OK did not yet feel the need to differentiate crazy blues from the large number of vaudeville-based recordings with blues in the title, then flooding the market. The appearance of competition to OK provided a clear sign of the value of this as yet unformed category. Other labels quickly caught on to the idea of vaudeville-based blues songs sung by African-American women. And companies like Arto, Columbia, Emerson, Pate, and uh, Jeanette all released such recordings during 1921, with the recordings of Lu Lucille Hegeman for Arto representing the fastest response to the success of Crazy Blues. Arto released two recordings by Hegeman that were listed in the February 15, 1921 issue of uh, Talking Machine World. They were titled The Jazz Me Blues and Everybody's Blues. <clears throat> However, Hegeman's next recording, listed the following month, in Talking Machine World had the most impact. Listed by Arto as a colored vocal record in what amounts to the first attempt in Talking Machine World to classify a recording made by an African American and aimed at African American listeners with its own identification mark category, Arkansas Blues, backed with I'll Be Good But I'll Be Lonesome, was a huge hit with the A-side rapidly covered by other African American artists in the process becoming the biggest blues success of the year. In terms of musical style, Hegeman's recordings resemble white vaudeville more closely even than does a recording like Crazy Blues. She sings in a light, clear voice associated with the legit theater of the time, with songs that come squarely out of the vaudeville, Tin Pan Alley blues genre. In this respect, Hegeman is closer than Mamie Smith to white contemporaries like, such as Nora Bays or May Irwin than to singers like Ida Cox or Bessie Smith, blues singers who were to emerge two years later with a sound closer to current conceptions of African-American vocal timbre. So this is uh, Arkansas blues. <laughs> OK began producing records directed toward a black audience with a separa separate numerical series for their catalog in the summer of 1921, paralleled by their production of a brochure describing releases of recordings by African Americans. However, the terminology in OK's brochures and catalogs was no more consistent than that used in the pages of Talking Machine World, as often as not borrowing Arto's practice of referring to these recordings as their colored catalog. The term race did, however, appear in music industry articles and advertisements directed towards an African-American audience during this time. But these appearances serve 
more as examples of slippage in the use of the term race than as consistent usages heralding a new musical category. As early as December 3rd, 1921, O'Kay employed the term race in an ad for Mamie Smith in the African-American newspaper, the Chicago Defender, proclaiming that the greatest race phonograph star can be heard only on OK Records. From this context, it is unclear whether this usage simply referred to Smith as a raced person or to a whole category for a type of music. Other references to African American artists by companies most active in recording classic blues, such as Paramount, followed OK's lead throughout 1922 and the first half of 1923. Race music, in other words, was not yet used as a categorical label. Rather, music performed by African Americans was advertised as music by great race musicians. In fact, from 1921 through to 1924, advertisements and articles used the term race with increasing frequency to refer to African Americans in a growing number of contexts, especially when record companies wished to signal to African American readers that they were referring to African-American musicians. In the labeling practice of the United States music industry from the beginning of 1921 to the end of 1924, the idea of race music was like a snowball rolling downhill, growing ever larger, yet imminently in danger of melting. Picking up a growing contingent of record companies who were becoming aware of the hitherto ignored audience of contemporary music performed by African-Americans. The next example displays, displays the genealogy of this category between um, March 1921 to November 1924, with the categories mentioned representing the first appearance of a particular terminology. So I have to lead you through this. This is really uh, my, my nerdishness completely unmasked. So check it out. Um, but there's a reason people say, why is there so much blank space? Um, and it's probably because I don't know how to set up a good chart. But also what I'm showing is I have all these record companies at the top, and then I have the first time they used some kind of uh, distinct categorical label for some type of black popular music um, in talking machine world. So you can see Arto, you know, was first, and then uh, OK picks it up. Arto went out of business, actually. So. Um, not much is happening in the next year. Different labels are used by a few different companies. Swan was involved, which was the only uh, African-American owned record company, but who didn't really want to record blues because they thought it was low class. They wanted to record mostly um, African-Americans performing Western art music. Um, and, uh, but then you can see in 1923, it's like all of a sudden people think, wow, this is really a distinct type of music, and we have to call it something. And then by the end of 1923, I put race music in, in boldface. It's kind of spreading like wildfire among all the record companies. And I thought the final clincher was when um, 1924 Columbia Records, that's why I end there, uh, finally uh, comes on board with the label. Because typically, uh, the same is true in the film industry with uh, the way genre names are used. Um, usually the, the most powerful um, companies uh, sort of resist innovations, as, uh, these innovations as long as they can and don't want to be seen to be followers. But uh, finally at this point it's as if Columbia can't uh, resist anymore and they sort of join on board. Of course Victor, the other major, uh, had a catalog out at this point but was not calling didn't have advertisements um, in Talking Machine World where they referred to this. So, um, not surprisingly, the discourse around race music in articles and advertisements expanded <coughs> in 1923 as well when the labels began to recognize its importance through the use of a distinctive category. Um, OK started to use the term race records to clearly denote a musical category in advertisements in the Chicago Defender as early as May 1923. Their headlining phrase, the world's greatest race artists on the world's greatest race records, brings together the demographic description with the newly born categorical label. 
The trope of homological relations, that is the direct relationship between uh, a, a, a genre and a group of people, um, was already reassuringly familiar at this point, both through foreign records and the previous couple of years of trying to find a name for race records. Thus, when the Aeolian Company initiated a new list of race records, the accompanying article acknowledged the following truism, quote, it has been recognized for some time that the Negroes had their own favorites among artists of their own race, and that records by such artists, particularly of blues, had a much stronger appeal than similar records made by white singers." End of quote. The African-American newspaper, the Chicago Defender, provides a panoramic view of the emergent category of race music due to the density of advertisements devoted um, to the emergent category. Because of this, one can see a subtle shift in the wording of advertisements for singers like Mamie Smith, Lucille Hegeman, and Alberta Hunter when compared with two singers who burst onto the race records market in 1923. While Mamie Smith and Hunter were praised with terms like fun and pep, <coughs> pep being a frequent adjective used in descriptions of early classic blues and jazz, Paramount's Ida Cox, the uncrowned queen of the blues, was touted for, quote, the real feeling in her songs and her blues whining voice. And you can see that here um, under the large type. Make way, you blues singers, for Ida Cox, the best that ever did it. She knocks them dead when she lets go with that blues whining voice. Honestly, folks, she's a wonder. There's real feeling in her songs. Um, OK, uh, Bessie Smith similarly um, was lauded for her moaning voice that drips with feeling. Here you can kind of, again, sorry for the brief production quality here, but you can still see in the uh, advertisement where it says, uh, when she looks around at where her baby ain't, she just can't help getting the baby won't you please come home blues. Bessie Smith puts a moaning minor into this lonesome blues that drips with what uh, long strayed with that long, strayed, or stolen feeling. So here's Ida Cox uh, with her Bama Bound Blues. Um, the rhetoric for Ida Cox and Bessie Smith closely anticipated the early ad copy for the first appearance of the person who would later be recognized as the first country blues artist to record. Paramount's announcement for Blind Lemon, Lemon Jefferson's debut amplified the language used for Bessie Smith and Ida Cox, promoting Jefferson's recordings as uh, a quote, a real old-fashioned blues by a real old-fashioned blues singer. With his singing, he strums his guitar in real southern style, makes it talk, in fact. End of quote. Um, so we'll listen to a bit of this, too. Um, this rhetoric of real feeling and a sound rooted in the past 
as an old fashioned and in the sight of the music's origins as in real southern style also referred to a slow shift in sound from the vaudeville blues of Mamie Smith and Lucille Hegeman with their quicker tempos, multi thematic forms, more legit sound and pep through Bessie Smith and Ida Cox with their slow tempos, heavier sound, increased use of bent and blue notes and 12 bar forms to Blind Lemon Jefferson, a self accompanied street singer with unpredictable phrasing and a rough vocal tone that could only come from the soul of the folk. The history and trajectory of music made largely by and for white people from rural areas in the southern United States is related to that of race music with, however, numerous noteworthy differences. Like race music, this music called at the time variously old time tunes, special records for the southern states, special southern records, square dance records, hill country music, and familiar tunes, could boast a prehistory of sorts with recordings made since the early years of the 20th century that evoked the rural south, but which were directed towards an urban <coughs> bourgeois northern audience, in other words, the mainstream. Here briefly, without going into as much detail as the other chart, I give a quick overview of highlights. Um, and you can see uh, when uh, Talking Machine World starts to identify this music uh, on a regular basis, it still can't really settle to, into any particular name, uh, even though it spreads uh, among the record companies much more quickly than did race music. Um, as I'll say, the first recording that was uh, people believe started the old time music boom and was in 19, June 1923. And by the end of 1924, it had already been sort of accept, uh, become a kind of category across the record industry. But again, there's this question of, of naming, which um, I'll get to in a minute, why in some respects it, it um, proved to be more difficult than with race music. Um, the the ra more rapid spread of hillbilly music may well have been due to the example of race music that led people in the music industry to accept more quickly a type of music linked to what they believed to be a marginal segment of the population. The downturn in sales across the industry that occurred after 1922 and the development usually ascri ascribed to the ascendance of radio might al have also made record companies more eager to explore new audiences which in turn required new categories. In retrospect, one of the curious aspects of this development is the difficulty in finding a widely agreed upon name for the emergent category of rural white Southern music. Most histories of American popular music will state that the name used by the participants in early country music during the 1920s was hillbilly music. Yet I will argue that a study of how the music was discussed at the time reveals a messier use of terminology. In fact, you can already see that. But there's an anecdote that Bill Malone uses in his book, which is that the name came from a group uh, that recorded in 1925. And when asked what the name of the group was, um, the, the leader named Al Hopkins said, well, I don't know. We're just a bunch of hillbillies. So just call us the hillbillies. And it appeared on a record label. But although he said that, um, it's clear the record companies were a little reluctant to use this as an official name for, for the type of music. Um, some of the difficulties with the term hillbilly music may be illustrated by examining one of the earliest usages of the term in a music industry publication. Uh, this occurred in a front page year end roundup in the variety dated December 29, uh, 1926. Music editor Abel Green in a section titled Hillbilly Music declares that the music, quote, is worthy of treatment on its own, being peculiar unto itself, end of quote. His description of the audience for this music, however, reflects the pejorative sense in which the term hillbilly music was, was undoubtedly being used among music industry personnel. This is his quote. The mountaineer is of poor white trash genera. The great majority, probably 95%, can neither read nor write English. Theirs is a community all unto themselves, illiterate and ignorant with the intelligence of morons, the sing-song nasal twanging vocalizing of a Vernon Dalhart or Car Carson Robeson on the discs, reciting the banal lyrics of a prisoner song or the death of Floyd Collins intrigues their interest. 
Despite Abel Green's certainty, the failure to accept the label hillbilly across the industry reflects a struggle over the term and uncertainty over its efficacy. For example, OK did not identify its series dedicated to this music as hillbilly until 1933. This is probably because, unlike race, a term that was used with pride by African Americans in the 1920s, hillbilly was a highly contested term, one that rural white Southerners might use among themselves, but which they found offensive when used by those outside of this group. The utility of the term was thus limited for advertising purposes, since offending the target audience is rarely effective. And the, and the term was never fully adopted as a label for the music across the range of people who were involved, including both urban dwelling music executives and the uh, myth almost mythical hill country mountaineers. And this is despite its subsequent use in historical narratives about this period of popular music, including those that I have written <laughs> before I did this research. Um, Archie Green, not to be confused with Abel Green, Archie Green, in a famous article that discusses the genealogy of the term hillbilly music, <coughs> anticipates in his conclusion some of those psychoanalytically influenced observations of a writer like Eric Lott uh, in his famous book on blackface minstrelsy, Love and Theft. Lott uses the phrase love and theft to describe the dynamic created by simultaneous impulses of desire and disavowal internalized by white people in the US towards cultural productions associated with African Americans. Green speculates that white Americans outside the South needed the South to experience both sentimental feelings of nostalgia and feelings of revulsion towards the putative ignorance and unrefined primitivism of its residents. That is, a desire for a past that never existed and disavowal of feelings such as racism that those outside the South could imagine as residing only in the South. For the white urban northern bourgeois, the poor white southerner possessed a status very similar to the African American. Like African Americans, increasing numbers of poor white southerners were migrating to urban areas in the north, becoming another example of the other within. Part of the difficulty of naming the hillbilly category may have to do with precisely the difficulty in delimiting this group from the majority. As overlapping and intermingling are inevitable anyway between demographic groups, vigilance is always required. When a group shares racial, religious, and linguistic characteristics, it is even more difficult. Hence, perhaps, the extreme violence of the language used in delimiting the hillbilly in Abel Green's 1926 article which, despite the very wide rampant racism towards African Americans at the time, nothing, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, you know, just insulting would, would have appe appeared in print in the, the music, in music industry publications at that time directed towards African Americans. Um, the prehistory of old time music differs also from that of race music, primarily because old time performers did not face the same restrictions as African Americans based on race, even if they did face a similar form of disdain um, on account of their lowly cultural status. During the teens, there were several recordings of country fiddling that were marketed as comic monologues or as novelty numbers. The popular 19th century comic routine, Arkansas Traveler, was recorded twice once in 1917 by fiddler Don Richardson, accompanied by piano, a typical old time instrument, not, <laughs> and then again in a violin duet but in 1922 by Eck Robertson. The important point here is that Richardson's recording, as well as Robertson's for that matter, was not made within the context of an ongoing industry-wide discourse that recognized these recordings as a distinct category of music. The same is true of, um, the other uh, recordings which Archie Green calls the comic derivatives and concert improvements of folk song that were available on cylinder or disc dating back to the 1890s. Ralph Peer of OK Records is generally credited with coming up with the idea of field trips in order to look for more uh, talent for race records. His first trip occurred in June 1923 after Polk Brockman, an Atlanta furniture store magnet, convinced Peer to record some country musicians as well. Peer recorded Fiddlin' John Carson. The recording did unexpectedly well, and the rest, as they say, is history. Carson was well known throughout the Atlanta area, 
having won the Georgia State Fillers competition seven times, and he had been featured on Atlanta's WSB radio station, achieving notoriety outside the Atlanta area as well. His style was so rough-hewn to Ralph Peer's ears that he pressed copies, that Peer pressed copies of the recording only to placate Brockman, who had assured Peer that they would sell. So this is um, Phil and John Carson's first recording for OK, uh, The Little Old Log Cabin in the Lane. Oh, no. Why did they do that? OK. Get to review the whole presentation very quickly here. OK. OK. Looks like that doesn't happen again. Oh, no. Here, I'll try something different. Don't leave. I promise to fix this soon. OK. <laughs> what? Yeah, OK. As stated earlier, compared to race music, old-time music was adopted much more quickly by other record companies following OK's lead. Country musicians were also allowed much more latitude than race artists in terms of the repertoire they recorded. Carl Hagstrom Miller, in his segregating book Segregating Sound, uh, argues compellingly that the repertories of black and white southern musicians were more varied than what eventually appeared on recordings, featuring healthy amounts of tunes currently popular in urban areas and outside of the South. Early country musicians were able to record some of this popular repertoire and were also able to incorporate instrumental and vocal approaches associated with mainstream popular music, meaning that old-time music exhibited a greater degree of internal variety than race music. Opportunities also existed for seasoned performers such as Vernon Dalhart. Dalhart, born in Texas, was a classically trained singer who had recorded a variety of minstrel material, coon songs, and light classical pieces beginning in 1916. With his career on the wane in the early 1920s, he realized that the old-time music boom could be his ticket to renewing his career. Authorship of Dalhart's greatest hit, The Prisoner's Song, is controversial. It may have been written by Dalhart's cousin, Robert Massey, who had actually served time in prison. Or it may be that Massey simply learned the song in prison, thereby strengthening its claims to be a kind of folk song. Backed by another folk-type song written in the early years of the 20th century, The Wreck of the Old 97, Dalhart recorded a song that signified as old time, even as his version bears about as much similarity to the work of Fiddle and John Carson as Tony Bennett's version of Cold, Cold Heart bore to that of Hank Williams.
Okay. Um, this recording of the Prisoner Song is estimated to have sold over 7 million copies during the 1920s. In some ways, then, the tra trajectory of early country music was almost the opposite of race music. What I mean is, if race music began with the ambiguously uh, identified cosmopolitan sounds of vaudeville and gras gradually over the course of five or six years moved to the sound of the folk rooted in an idea of a pre-technological past, then old time music began with the sound of rusticity and moved to a stylized cosmopolitan notion of the rural folk. I want to close by stressing the connection of popular music categories in the 1920s with the theme of the site where I am speaking, that is rock and roll. The two types of music that I've been discussing here, which were called race music and old time tunes, among other things, in the 1920s, remained separate from mainstream popular music until the mid 1950s, although they remained in dialogue during this time with the mainstream. From the 1920s through the 1950s, there were numerous cover versions of old time and race records, and even the occasional crossover hit, although these were usually marketed as novelty numbers. What I hope to have demonstrated here is that the categories of race and old time music were themselves extremely diverse and were at the moment of formation already engaged in a complex relationship with mainstream popular music. One of the achievements was of rock and roll was that it exposed the unacknowledged musical and expressive interconnections between the three categories of popular music. My point here is similar to that made by Philip Ennis in his book The Seventh Stream and by several other, off other authors. But what I want to stress here is that the boundaries of race music, old time, <coughs> and mainstream popular music were always porous. Despite the haziness of their borders, these categories continued to serve a purpose. Put in broad terms, popular music genres provide a way in which we can connect in an individual sense of self with a broader community with whom we imagine that we identify. In other words, genres provide a way to join an in individual sense of lived identity with an imagined community. It should come as no surprise, therefore, that in the United States, as long as we have used categories to make sense of the world of popular music, these categories have been associated with our national obsessions with race, place, and class. Thank you. Everybody can just, when David calls and you wait until Stephanie comes around, <laughs> so that the folks in the stream can hear the question and also we can document it for the tape. David. Let the feasting begin. Yes. Thanks for your presentation. I struggle daily with iTunes. I mean, I use it, but obviously the, the genres it tells me my music is a part of are problematic. I'm wondering <laughs> if you've seen anything just in the age of iTunes, a, a similar kind of narrative to what you've shown? Is there something very strange going on with how they're labeling music? Yes. <laughs> but there always is, in a way, you know. I, I think so, because um, I, I, think for, I think really through the 1990s, you could argue there, that these three categories I'm tracing were still um, sort of central, I think, to the way the music industry, you know, marketed music and connected with people. But I think it's, you know, um, there already were, you know, increasing number of categories. If you look at uh, magazines like Billboard or something, even the 1990s, there were 32 different, you know, popularity charts and stuff. But I think, you know, particularly with internet-based uh, consumption and so forth, the ability to target people in an ever more precise way uh, you know, has, has really grown and, and accelerated. But at the same time, I think, you know, it can make you, you know, the, it's to the advantage of the company. Well, they have to put things somewhere or else, you know, you don't know where to look. I mean, it was the same thing in the day of record stores. Um, but um, I think s sometimes, uh, you know, the more you know about a particular kind of music, the more weird the categories can seem, I think. And uh, I think... I was talking with Jason yesterday, and uh, you, didn't you say that uh, there's this ministry recording that 
it, it came out and it was marked as uncategorizable or something by iTunes. Undefinable. Undefinable. Like, has that ever happened? Because, of course, anything can be defined given your perspective from it. And there, there's, you know, it doesn't, uh, it's to the disadvantage of the music industry to, to not categorize something. But yeah, of course, it's like I, like I say, the more you know about something, the more you become aware of the internal variety of, of things and how they're not like other things. But you know, it's one of the paradoxes of these labels that uh, people still use to communicate um, about music with, but um, they still speak to everyone differently, even as that happens. So, so it's just a contradiction that's built into the whole concept. David, thanks. That was great. Do you have any um, insight into how really kind of what the process is for creating those categories within the chart makers or within the labels? You know, how, how those decisions got made or, you know, what, wh where we can, where, where can we trace them to, if any? <laughs> well, um, as I said, that, that's one of the interesting things. I mean, there are cases where labels have been invented and that, um, that have seemed to, to work. Um, and there, there are different levels of, of these categories and genres, too. I, I should back up and say that. I mean, if you say, look at Billboard and uh, look at the 1940s, they have, th at the end of the 1940s, they change the label of um, old time music or whatever to country and western, and race records is changed to rhythm and blues, and those stay put. But so there's sort of genre or category operating at that level, but at the same time, there are other um, levels like radio formats, um, you know, iTunes uh, genres, things used by record stores, th and then just terms that uh, fans and musicians and critics use. And uh, I think in many cases, you know, th it's, I don't think it's a case of um, someone's you know, consciously being able to use something and impose it. It's more that a term starts to be used and it's useful to enough people that, that it sort of catches on and then, you know, establishes a kind of foothold. But that, that's another interesting, why I looked w and I wanted to present this race music um, example in such detail because you can become aware it's like there's no agent to this particular history. It's just many people in dialogue with each other trying things out until a term, they hit on a term that, you know, serves the, the marketing purposes, it makes sense to the people, other people working in that uh, genre of music. And it also tells us something interesting about uh, what's important to, to those people at the time or, or to the society at large. So I had another conclusion for a different version of this paper, which I didn't, I could only have one conclusion, so I couldn't use it. but. <laughs> But why the use of, say, race music? I think it's very significant because uh, for the African-American community at the time, it was a positive term. Uh, you know, to be a race person was someone who was fighting for the improvement of the race. And, you know, these other terms were tried out, you know, the colored catalog, the blah, blah. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't catch on. So I don't really know. I mean, I don't have a, an exact explanation, but... Um, it says something interesting. For the same reason, I think the record companies were reluctant to use hillbilly music at that time as a term. Um, so it's a kind of dance with the, the people participating in it and not wanting to turn off. You know, you don't want to turn off the consumers and the, and the musicians who are, uh, who are making the music. And uh, you need to find a term that is going to signify, you know, what kind of music it is to the broadest, largest number of people. But it seems to be kind of a haphazard uh, process from what I can see. Well, uh, um, as you say, uh, the earlier forms uh, did seem to be a cumulative sort of thing, but uh, the specificity of Jerry Wexler calling it rhythm and blues mm -hmm. uh, is, is the quite uh, uh, the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, A, if, um, if there is uh, knowledge of who specified country and western in the way that Wexler specified rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. and uh, how you would account for um, 
or not account for, but uh, is this because the growing strength of the record industry in general, uh, or Billboard magazine specifically, that, uh, that they are able to formulate this so definitively uh, in the 40s? Um, yeah, well, I think it, it, it says a lot to the, the um, changes in the, the music industry during the 1940s, and that um, it became, I think it became a lot more organized. And um, at first, you know, these, what's also interesting is these, these other types of music always hit these music industry people just by surprise, like, because, you know, they don't, they don't really know anything about it. It's not their kind of music, and they think, you know, why would anyone like it? And then they realize people do like it, and, you know, they better start selling it. And I think during the 1940s, country music and, and R&B um, just, uh, you know, uh, it became obvious that, you know, th there was a lot of money to be made from it. And um, Philip Ennis in his book just shows, like, just even the number of positions they have on the chart grows, you know, as a way, a necessary way of tracking, you know, what's going on uh, in terms of sales and the market and things like that. So I think there was a recognition of that. Um, I think, um, yeah, why uh, Billboard was able to sort of establish that. I guess it, they had become the preeminent uh, uh, publication at that point, although they had competition, but it seemed like it was pretty much adopted immediately. Um, Wexler, I know, gives the <coughs> explanation that, you know, the term race was outdated and this was uh, somehow a more, you know, something that was more contemporary that somehow spoke to it. No one else, I mean, probably if he, if he had named country and western music, then we would know who did it too, because, <laughs> uh, but whoever did, I guess, didn't, you know, didn't want the credit for it, so I don't know who did it. And of course, the western part got dropped. I mean, by the end of the 50s, it was just being called country music. Um, but no, that's an interesting question. David, have you, uh, <coughs> there's kind of an interesting contradiction, and I hadn't thought about it to you since till tonight. You showed the Blind Lemon Jefferson ad for Paramount, but as Paramount gains more prominence, <coughs> even though race is a positive term, the ads for Paramount become more stereotypical, mm. if, if you know what I mean. The, oh, yeah, the yeah. drawings of drugs and uh, African Americans riding mules. And as I understand it, most of that, tar most of that marketing was targeted at an African American audience. So uh -huh. you, you wonder who was, uh, how did that play out? You, have you thought about that much at all in categories? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, if you, you are brought face to face with a lot of really um, things that seem paradoxical. I mean, uh, the popularity of, um, y you know, I mean, certain forms of minstrel based humor among, you know, the African American communities that you'd think, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Um, or, you know, another, uh, another version of this when I talk about foreign music, um, I talk about this category called Jewish music. That was it. So that even then you, you had this thing where, you know, there, there seemed to be, the, they seemed to be using these insulting stereotypes about themselves in these recordings. Um, so, you know, I think uh, why, why this, works. I, I mean, people usually are comfortable making fun of themselves, you know, and, uh, but not when people outside the group are using the same kind of terminology or language. Even in the early race music ads, there's things that are, you know, deri images derived from minstrelsy. I didn't show any, but, um, you know, at first I think it was because they, it depends what publication it's into. Like if it's in Talking Machine World, they're clearly addressing it to a wide audience. And uh, Chicago Defender, though, that, that's not true. I, I, I didn't see uh, in the early 20s those kinds of minstrel-based ads in the Chicago Defender. Um, but, you know, why things that seem like negative stereotypes are popular among people of, of, of the group that's being stereotyped is, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. It seems to happen over and over again. I can only think that you know, as long as it's an in-group kind of thing, you know, it can seem, it's, you're laughing at yourself somehow, you know. But, uh, yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, hi. Um, I, firstly, I wanted to say I've taught from your Pop Rock and Soul Reader book, and it's awesome. Thank you. <coughs> it's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Um, anyway, um, so you talk about genre as a kind of identity thing for audiences, that um, it's as much about categorizing music as it is about categorizing yourself if I, for listening to it. Um, so I wondered what you thought about the, Im, you know, the imagined community of the wider pop market, you know, in this period, uh, hot jazz or whatever, um, and later on the kind of bigger pop market. And I wondered what you th thought about the identity of audiences for those kind of broader categories, or if there are any characteristics that um, fit those. Um, well, uh, on the I think. The assumed identity is, uh, I think I said, you know, white, northern, bourgeois, urban dwellers. In fact, one thing that makes it mainstream music is that it, you know, is something that's heard, you know, beyond the limits of any one group. Um, but just like often, you know, white, straight men are a category that's not particularly marked. Um, the same is true of the main category of popular music, you know, and, and so you always, you know, focus on um, I, a characteristics and identities that are not part of the, you know, group in power or whatever. So I think it functions in that way. But, I mean, this music, uh, the mainstream popular music of the 1920s was, um, Carl Hagstrom Miller has these great, uh, descriptions of how when they went to record the musicians in the South, black and white, and, and uh, you know, they'd say, well, what do you want to record? And they, you know, just get out their guitar and say, well, I want to do this Al Jolson number that I just heard on the radio. And they go, no, 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 don't do that, you know. We want some real, you know, Southern music. And they're like, no, but my, uh, you know, people I play for really like this song. And, you know, there was this kind of thing. So that's, um, even if the category name itself is not invented by the music industry, they have the power to filter what goes into that category and to establish certain kinds of, of connections. And um, one thing that uh, Hagstrom Miller makes and, and, get, and um, Elijah Wall uh, in his book, How the Beatles Destroyed Rock and Roll, is also just talking about how working musicians were rewarded for their um, versatility. And so if you wanted to work, you had to play whatever audiences uh, wanted from you. You couldn't afford to say, I'm just going to play, you know, country blues or something. And so they were kind of dumbfounded by these record industry people who were saying, no, no, don't do all this stuff that they knew their audiences liked. So there may be, on the one hand, there's kind of the, the sort of public image of a certain type of music. And then... There's the very diverse ways the music is used by different people, by audiences and, and musicians, which again, as often, doesn't have a neat one-to-one -one relationship with any particular type of music. All right, any other questions, no? Well again, thank you, David. David thank Brackett you. for coming out tonight. Thank and thank you everyone for coming as well. And we hope to see you in the fall when Andy uh, Flory will be our next guest in the series. Thank you for coming out tonight.